Okay, very good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for making time to come here and participate uh, in this session. Um, clearly, there's been a slate of very prominent speakers, and I'm very happy to be here to uh, open the event. And the ELC has been encouraging, I think, many of the companies uh, to come together, to collaborate, uh, to put in resources generally to do good, encouraging people to join good companies, to support good causes. And I think all of us know that this is the right thing to do. I think all of us know that it's the right thing to do. These are things that you are doing. But I thought it's useful before we proceed to actually ask ourselves and to remind ourselves again, why is it the right thing to do? We assume we know. I think we, deep down inside us, we all know that this is, this is the correct thing. But have we paused and really asked ourselves and really dig down deep to ask ourselves really, why is it so fundamentally important? I think it's fundamentally important for a number of reasons. So let me, let me start. All of you here are leaders in your own right, right? Many of you, you lead, you manage, and I would say that many of us will have slightly different definitions about leadership. We have different leadership philosophies, and, but there are certain aspects that are quite fundamental, and I think it's common, and all of us understand that. We all know that ultimately people make things happen. People is the key to all organizations, because people make up organizations. People come up with processes, come up with structures. As the world is changing at a very fast rate, it's people who will have to sense make, people will have to come up with solutions, people will have to deliver the solutions. So the key really is how do you achieve your desired outcomes, and to go beyond that really depends on our people. But how do you then motivate them to go the extra mile? I think people are inherently motivated, especially with salaried workers, we're doing our job, we want to do well. So there's a certain baseline that I think we will achieve. But to be truly outstanding requires us to go further, to believe in something more. And that's where leaders come in. That's where leadership teams come in. What is it that makes a person or makes a team respond and to really go the extra mile. And we all know that effective leadership is key. There are many, many different factors, but one, what would be the one thing that is perhaps above all most critical in leadership? Just think about it. What would your response be? I think it's about trust. People trusting you people being prepared to follow you. Because if no one follows you, you follow someone because you trust them. Because if no one follows you, you're not really a leader, you're probably more a manager. But you should ask a, we should ask the question also, what engenders trust? What engenders trust? What makes you trust someone? Think about your own context, your own situation. What makes you trust somebody? Well, again, I think we will have different responses, but I would say that one of the very fundamental things that make us trust somebody would be values, who you are as a person, as a leader. Not just what you say, but what, how you say it, what you don't say, what you do, what you don't do, how you do things. On a daily basis, the real you that is demonstrated by the way you walk the talk or by the way you do not walk the talk, there will engender that sense that is this someone or is this team a team that I'm prepared to follow, then prepared to really go the extra mile and do something special. And I think we all understand that from a very individual perspective, certainly as leaders and certainly as an organization. I'm sure in all your organizations, emblazoned on the wall and the plaque will be your vision, your mission, your set of values. But just because you have it, does it mean that individuals and organization actually lives it out on a day-to-day -day basis. Because values are very personal. You can't mandate them. How do you inculcate? How do you nurture? How do you bring into play these values? Especially in, an, in a working world where all of us are adults, we have already, I suppose, to some degree, pretty much formed up in our perspectives to lives. How do you actually do this without being prescriptive, without being preachy about it? Because we all know that outstanding organizations come because of people, strong people culture, and again, it comes back to the same recurring themes. 
people believing in something more. I think all of us are inherently self-seeking, selfish to some degree, wanting to do well for ourselves. And that will bring a company, an organization, a group so far. But to really break beyond that, you need to look beyond self. You need to look at the team. There's a collective belief. So you, we understand how critical that is. So the question is, what actually do we do? Now, if we think about this from a nation's perspective, is it any less important? Do we need to tend to the heart and soul of a nation? It can seem a bit waffly, a bit airy-fairy perhaps, but is it not fundamentally important to ensure a nation's survival and for a nation to thrive? It isn't just about the functional responsibilities carried out by the ministries, whether on the security front, the economic front, on the social front. But how about the softer aspect of society? Is it important? I think we all know that it is, but the question is, what do we do? And what are those values that are so important? The same way that we talked about it from an individual perspective and a corporate perspective, what's the equivalent conversation at a national level? Well, again, there are many, many different values that obviously would be important. Resilience, diligence, hardworking. But again, I would say that it's very much related to what we talked about earlier. Being prepared to see the to see beyond yourself. Are we prepared to rally around the idea of a nation? This sense of community. Are we prepared to move beyond me and also to consider the we in our society? Which means perhaps being less self-entitled, that whatever we think and whatever we feel isn't just about me and myself and my immediate sphere, but that there is a broader society that we need to think about. Because what's ideal for an individual Singaporean is not always optimal for Singapore as a society. There are tensions. What is best for society isn't always ideal for individuals. And you add in the other dimension of time. I need this now versus we also need things for the future. We talk about sustainability in our organizations. We need to talk about sustainability as a nation. Are we, a, are we prepared to forego certain benefits that we know we want, but we know that we need to keep the system sustainable, to keep the budget balanced, to be diligent, to be disciplined? Is that important? Because especially for Singapore, where you do not have other resources, your reserves, your savings are critical. We do not know what the future will hold for us, but you need that buffer. Unlike many other countries and many from where you come from, you have many other resources. You dig a hole on the ground, oil comes out. You mine. Even water, we need to import and collect and to renew. So we have constraints which perhaps many countries don't face. But do we need to be responsible? Do we need to be stewards for the larger community and for the future? And I think we know we do. But are we prepared to consider that? Are we prepared to look beyond self? So again, it comes back to the same thing. How do you then talk about this at the national level where as Singaporeans, as individuals, we begin to look beyond self? So I think we all know that it's important. We all can put up the rhetoric, the messages about being a caring, inclusive, compassionate society. But the question is, what do you do about it? It's easy to talk but we must be able to break it down into bite-sized chunks, things that we can do. Because otherwise, it is just talk. And if we believe that it's fundamentally important, then we should ask ourselves, then what can we do? Which is where it comes back to where I started off from, is this desire to do good, to come together, to collaborate, to do CSR, to volunteer, to contribute. These activities do not exist for its own sake. They're not just activities. They cannot be just activities because and it's not even about helping the disabled, the poor, the less privileged. It is. But I would suggest that it is very, very much more. And I think it's important for us to perhaps ponder and to think about it. 
because it will instruct us in the way we try to carry this out. Think about it. What other activity can you think of that would enable us to emotionally engage and to be moved? St. Francis says that it's in giving that we receive. It is in giving that we receive. It's not about doing things for you, it's asking us to do something for others. And in that, in turn, we receive, we change. Those of you who are active on the social front, when you volunteer regularly, when you reach out to others who care for others, not your immediate family, but others who really you have no reason to care for, I think you understand. There's a certain joy that comes from caring for others in realizing that you can actually make a difference. Because deep down inside, all of us, even though there's one part of our nature which is perhaps inherently selfish, self-seeking, but there's another part which I think makes us human, which is the capacity to love, to have compassion, to have empathy, to want to care for others. But we also need a vehicle for those emotions and those values to manifest itself. For us to be able to love, to reach out, to remind us that we are human, that we are compassionate, that we can be empathetic. So when we begin to reach out, one, we learn to become circumspect about what we have. We learn to count our blessings. Because sometimes, you know how it is. It happens here in Singapore, and I'm sure it happens in many of your countries, where we are grumbling about every other thing. But we forget that we have many blessings that we often take for granted. Why? Because we're just preoccupied with self. Why am I not getting this? Why am I not getting that? But we forget that there are many other considerations as well. As a result of outreach, I think it helps keep us grounded. But more importantly, do you think that it changes us? What other activities allow this change to happen? Values can't be put on a wall. Values can't be just taught and talked about. Values must be lived. It comes from action. In the schools today, we call it the Values in Action program, which I think is a very apt and accurate term. Because the schools are encouraged to get the students to embark on some of these service learning, service activities, and they call it Values in Action. Because it is in action that values are realized. So as we begin to think about this, perhaps the whole space that we are in to come together, to collaborate, to do good, isn't just about doing good for its own sake, isn't just about activities, because it's very easy to just focus on activities. Organizing and making sure that logistics are done, the safety considerations. But the process is important. We need to curate the opportunities we provide for our staff in our companies. So if indeed this is the way in which we can effect change, then perhaps when we talk about CSR, when we talk about outreach, when we talk about volunteering, it isn't just about that alone, but it's about an opportunity for us to build a very different society. What other ways can you think of that through which we can bring about this change? Personally, I can't think of many. I cannot think of many. We we'll depend on school. We look at families, of course, but we have no leverage and no levers on what families do or not do. Schools, we have some degree of leverage, so in terms of education, so programs like BIA, we try to do what we can. Not perfect, but getting there. What else do we have to begin to inculcate some of these sense of values of community and looking beyond self in a society? Which is why I think the social sector is about bringing people on board and being involved, because that's where the change is going to happen. And that's where I think we're going to build a very different society. But that's where all of us can play a part. So what do we do? So when we talk about hubbing for good, coming together to do good, there are basically three buckets I'm looking at. Schools. It's a captive audience. Imagine a vision where is it possible for us to enable every child that leaves the school system, apart from being educated, being skilled, being trained, etc., etc., is it possible that we ensure that every child that leaves school, as far as we can, desire to do good, wanting to help, wanting to care for others. Is it possible? Is it possible? Last week, I visited Badok View Secondary School. They partnered Katong APSN, a special needs school, and where some of the students would be involved in recess time over an hour to cook together with 
fellow students with special needs. In the process, they learn. They know that there are individuals with special needs. But many of us don't necessarily have that contact point. But as a result of the activity curated so that the students reflect, they think about what they are learning. And when I talk to them, when you read the reflections of other students who have participated in these activities, you know that there has been a change. They learn to be empathetic. They learn to care for others, to be more patient. We find that true of many, many other equivalent activities. Now, if this can happen at a tactical scale from one activity, there are obviously many other activities that possibly could engender this. Could we work with the school so that we program more of these activities? So is it possible? Should that be a vision that every child leaves school wanting to give, wanting to care? and programs like VIA, yes, you're clocking up, you're being involved, maybe even compulsory, but if you curate it well, if it's meaningful, I think you can imagine how this could have a significant impact. And then they enter the workforce, which is where you are in. In the corporate social responsibility world, many of us increasingly are beginning to do more of this. Are we motivated by corporate branding reasons? We think about sustainability, we think about what the boards are expecting of us and some of the requirements that the business fraternity is now expecting us to do. But again, it's important to rem remind ourselves why it is so fundamentally important. And for the reasons I've shared earlier, I think there's a strong business proposition as well. Because if your workforce is ready and keen, and we know that many young people today desire to do good and to be involved, but they don't always find that those opportunities. In a recent survey, I think by NVPC, we find that about 50% of companies do provide such opportunities. But we also find a dip. Many young people want to do good. Overall, but participation rate is about 41%. It can increase, and I think it should increase. But at 25 to 34 age, there's a dip. After school, they enter the workforce, there are other distractions, but the company's also ready to do more. So this is the other receptacle. Let's assume that we work and do our best with the schools. Now, what can we do at a corporate world? What can you do in your respective spaces? And this is where we believe that we should try again, as, as we try to do it with the schools, can we try to help work within this space to pull the different groups together to collaborate? Now, we all know the demographic story, which is not unique to Singapore. It is unfolding as we speak in Japan in a very big way, and it's going to affect many, many countries and especially cities where we are living longer and birth rates are declining, especially in cities. And in Singapore, we know that. Come 2030, our will be one of those statistics that is one in four that will be 65 and above. Out of a resident population of three over a million, 900,000 of us will be age 65 and above. But rather than look at it as a challenge, is it possible for us to be that one nation, to be that one city-state, that not only will we be living longer, but we're going to age well. But you're, you ain't going to do it if you're just going to depend on social workers and nursing officers. You need to mobilize the community. So imagine this. If as part of our outreach efforts, whether in school or the corporate world, when we know the elderly folks, many of them are probably well active, no problem. But increasingly, there'll be those who may be isolated, who may have their physical, mental health ailments, who will need befriending, visitation. Some, perhaps a bit more intensive, once a week, some once a fortnight, some once a month, just to touch base, connect with them. Because remember, families are smaller. Let's assume they're filial and they visit, but not all are. Globalization will remain. With whatever small family you have, they may be abroad. So isolation increasingly becomes an issue. And of course, in Singapore, we are quite small, so geographically less isolated in many of your countries, which is so much more bigger than Singapore, isolation will be even more acute. But imagine if we are able to structure a program. For example, if your company is in Topayo, which is an old estate, we have many lower-income families, elderly folks who are there. But what if we work with the Senior Activity Centre, with the local grassroots, we know the data with, with Ministry of Health, with the Pioneer Generation Office, because our Pioneer Generation ambassadors visit those who are 65 and above to 
to see how they are, I explain policies to them, but in the process, they're picking up actually valuable inputs. Some are isolated, some are vulnerable, some need attention and help. But when we begin to piece together the information, can we then link up with a company and say, look, we operate in this area, we are able to actually help with visitation, befriending. And imagine if I begin to broker and partner, I understand the demand, I know the information, I pair up with the supply, the suppliers of help. And then you curate that. At lunchtime, after lunch, after work, we pop by half an hour, 45 minutes, one hour. You can break down whatever number of days you allocate to your staff, one day, two days, whatever it may be. Break it down into four hour blocks. It's nearby, no reason, don't have to travel anywhere. In a small group, in a section, a department, whatever it is, visit this family, that family. And you can imagine as you replicate this between the companies that operate in Topayo, the schools where it's age appropriate, the local community where you can mobilize neighbors and volunteers, is it conceivable that we begin to actually establish a program where we regularly visit those who are isolated? We need to do it now to get ready for the future when the numbers can be overwhelming and develop a habit. And the beauty of it is this. Not only will we be able to begin to meet real needs, we begin to prevent problems. Because as you engage those who are isolated physically, their well-being, I think there's a positive impact. I can also pick up when individuals physically deteriorate. It has a big impact on the way we handle healthcare. They are not to speak about their quality of life, but we make sure that healthcare is a lot more sustainable. At the same time, for those of us who are younger, we are also preparing for when our time comes because we understand those issues. And imagine doing this as a company, with my section, with my department. What other activities do you have to bring employees together with management, with leadership, doing something meaningful together? It's not going out for barbecue, cohesion activities, which are important, it's fun, but this allows us to operate together on a different plane altogether. And we begin to realize that our company is different. The relationships go deeper because we're engaging in an activity which is fundamentally different. That happens with the students in school. That can happen with your corporate entity as well. And similarly, the third bucket, which is the local community, at school, at work, at home, in the local community, with volunteers, neighbors, etc. In the neighborhood, basically, you're also creating bonds among neighbors. If within the same block of flat, we say, look, there are a couple of elderly folks that need visitation, or those with special needs, you can begin to imagine how you can begin to program this, and neighbors begin to coordinate amongst each other. It strengthens neighborly ties. When you talk about nation building, it sounds very big, but it comes down to relationships. So this operates at many, many levels. There's a virtuous cycle that builds on itself. So at school, at work, at home, if you imagine that we begin to embrace doing good, coming together to collaborate, understanding the information, being more needs-driven, rather than creating projects because we think people need the, these activities, companies sometimes moving from one course to another to look for the different experience, but can we begin to look at longer-term partnerships and begin to curate and meet real needs and begin to do preventive work? Children, for example, we're starting a program called Kids Start, where we want to intervene with children from more vulnerable families from year zero, even at the stage when the mothers are pregnant. These are from lower income families, more vulnerable families, because we know that intervention at the early stage makes a tremendous amount of difference to lifetime outcomes. So apart from formal government programs, volunteers could be involved, befriending to support the families to scaffold the support around them. Reading programs, is it conceivable that your companies could participate? Because some of these children will not have that exposure at home. So they enter primary school with a gap with other children who perhaps receive those exposure. But if a company says, look, we operate nearby, Tuesdays, we are able to commit two, three hours in the evening, we'll come by, give us a space, we will do some of these reading programs for those children identified. Possible? Would you be able to find volunteers from your organizations to do that? And that's one company. If another is able to commit on Wednesday, another on Thursday, I could theoretically have reading programs every day. Okay, we don't need so many. But is it possible? Do you think it will have an impact? It's not just about reading, remember. As you begin to engage regularly, and not just in and out, you begin to also establish a relationship. Because for some of these children, they may not have 
perhaps very strong role models at home. They may hit it off with some of the volunteers and they have someone they could turn to to share their problems and issues and I can pick up issues early, intervene early. And that's what I found on the ground with my own volunteers in my own estate where I'm a member of parliament. So again, when we begin to organise ourselves, when we begin to hub, when we begin to collaborate, share information, understand the needs and organise ourselves, there's a tremendous amount of good we can do. But more importantly, I think it has a tremendous impact on who we are as individuals. Let me cite you some examples. So what we are trying to do is to how, how do we facilitate, how do we make volunteerism more convenient? So NCSS, for example, has piloted new service-based volunteerism model. So volunteers can come in direct contact with beneficiaries on a regular basis. So we have the Singapore Power Group, Post Bank, Suntech Singapore, are currently on board this partnership where we match. That means those of you here who are prepared to and are keen to explore a different way of partnering, could we then curate and partner you with VWOs, social organisations or geographical areas who are keen to also change? Because it's not just about the givers. The receivers need to change. If they do not change their work processes, they will sometimes have no idea how to take in volunteers. Because they think that, oh, this is, you need to be trained to do this. But actually, uh, many of these activities don't necessarily need that. They don't know how to manage volunteers. But that's why corporate schools, organisations are valuable because they help you manage the volunteers. Because you can imagine small VWOs or small setups will find it difficult. Who's coming today to run the reading programme? Are you coming? You're not coming? But an organisation will say, we will organise ourselves. Tuesday, we will be there. The Japanese Association, for example, the wives of the Japanese community here has been volunteering in mines. It's children with special needs for 20, 30 years. I don't remember which day they commit themselves to, but there's one day, one afternoon that they go regularly. And basically what happens is that for, the, for mines, for this organisation, that afternoon's programme is settled. I can free up my trained staff to do the complex work which we as average volunteers are not able to do. This allows our VWOs and geographical organisations to expand their capacity without necessarily the headcount. So we want to curate that experience, establish a partnership. SP Group, for example, from Singapore Power Group, they volunteer at the Senior Activity Centre in Geelang Baru, which is under Touch Community Services. They conduct morning exercises for the elderly, serve them breakfast. This partnership began in February 2017. About 20 staff from SP Group, because we wanted to try to see what's the experience like for them on a regular basis as they reach out to some of these folks. And the elderly residents clearly find some of these faces familiar because of the regularity. They look forward to meeting some of them. And the volunteers from the group reported a higher sense of morale and satisfaction from the company. Not surprising. POSB, Post Bank. They have embarked on service-based volunteering model. The staff from four branches located in Jurong started their volunteering session in May with NTUC Health Nursing Home. About 20 employees per session, befriending elderly residents who had a home who otherwise would have very little contact with the community due to the lack of mobility. So many of them will volunteer early in the morning before they go to work. And then after that, going to their banks. And the banks, where it's possible, adjust to make sure there's flexible time. Even my own NCSS, where our volunteers volunteer on a bi-weekly basis, we break down the allocated time into bite-sized chunks and for them to begin to actually be actively involved. And I think the feedback has been positive. So I think what we're trying to do here is that once we understand the idea that it is valuable, it's important, that it makes sense, then how do we then begin to broker this? So this is where I urge all of us to consider that as we embark on the CSR journey, and many of us are already on that journey, remind ourselves why we are doing this, how far we can go. Can we build a very different society? I think it is possible. When you break it down, you buy such, I'm not going to change the world, I'm not going to change Singapore, but I can change the environment in my company through the way I do things. At the same time, can we also encourage? What can companies do? Partner, structure, let's organize ourselves, provide flexibility. Is it possible even if it's not perhaps for every department? On a Friday, every fortnightly, every once a month, last Friday of the month, we will knock off earlier, four o'clock. Let's then go our different ways, three hour blocks as we go out and volunteer in the different, for the different causes nearby where our companies are. I think you will begin to have 
will realize that there's going to be a very different impact on your companies. But I would also encourage you to consider, as we talk about volunteering, we also have a program, Share as One, and many of you here in Singapore will know what it is, where we commit ourselves, whether it's a dollar, two dollars, five dollars a month from our paycheck to com community chess. We want to encourage companies to up that level. Even for my own ministry, we have made it opt out. Everybody, as a default, will contribute, but you can, you can opt out if you wish to. Companies sometimes are wary about doing this, but you'd be surprised. There's actually very positive response to it. It may not seem much, additional one, two dollars, but it makes a lot of difference when you ensure there's a steady stream of funds going to community chess, where every single dollar goes to beneficiaries. And with the Share as One program, what we will do is to look at your contributions as a company, whatever additional you're able to bring to bear, we will match that and we also provide funding to your companies to fund your company activities. So I do encourage you as we embark on trying to broker and trying to structure better programs, participate in the Share as One program as well, so that we can also provide those funds, so that funds can also come in. So money remains important, so please don't stop donating. But I'm also looking at your time and the quality of time. And the last message really is do also consider inclusive hiring. Just as we talk about how perhaps as we are engaged in reaching out to others and the impact it has on us, actually when we talk about inclusive hiring, hiring people with special needs, realigning some of our work processes so that individuals with special needs could be employed. Again, it is not just about charity, about including them, but having them in our midst again has an impact on the work environment the work culture, our values. And certainly many companies who have embarked on it have found that people have become more patient, more tolerant, more understanding. KK Hospital, for example, have some of our frontline staff with special needs. It has an impact on the way customers deal with the frontline staff as well. So this is where perhaps I'll end off by saying that while the theme, I think, for this conference is about leadership, about what we can be as better leaders. But I'll say a very big part, again, coming back to the very fundam the fundamentals, is that being an effective leader is about mastery of self, being self-aware, your sense of values. But at a corporate level, at a national level, the themes are not dissimilar. It is about our ability to inspire. It's about our ability to tap deep into every individual that actually we desire to do good that we want to be part of something special, something meaningful. Otherwise, we will just be focused on self. And with that, you are not going to go very far as an individual, you're not going to go very far as an organization, and certainly you're not going to go very far as a nation. But I think the only way that I can think of that we're able to draw this out is through doing good, giving, caring, volunteering, not for its own sake, but because that's the way change happens. And this is what I put to you as you think about leadership, as you think about your organizations, and how perhaps by embracing some of these activities in the right spirit, it can actually make a tremendous amount of difference. Which is why I think we all know it's the right thing to do. We all have some activities or whatever that we may be already doing but it is far, far more important than we realize. So this is something that I hope all of us perhaps could just think about, and I would urge you, and certainly those of you from Singapore, to consider doing more, stepping up, curating the journey, because in our own way, if you begin to embark on this journey and hopefully doing it right, or as right as we can, step by step, individual by individual, as we begin to change, society will change, and we will build a very different Singapore. So with that, thank you very much, and I wish you all a very fruitful and successful conference. Thank you.